this morning. Let me read just a few of the verses here to get us started. And we we'll, we should invite the presence of the Lord. Father, we ask you to teach us. Holy Spirit, come be our teacher today. If you do not teach us, we're wasting our time. But Lord, we believe you will teach us as we look into your word. So come, Holy Spirit, give us revelation in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 14, Paul writing to the church at Rome, except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge? Now that sentence goes on, but I want to stop right there. Who are you to judge? And we quickly realize that the key words in this phrase is judge. Who are you to judge? Definition of judge, one who gives an authoritative opinion. But the problem is, <laughs> normally, we tend to give an opinion without being asked. We tend to judge without being invited to share our opinion. See, and I'm a skill at that. Most of you are skilled at that, too. Believe me, I know that. And I'm skilled at it. We are quite free to give our opinions, but that's where the problem lies. We can judge to ourselves, but when we start giving it to other people, we have a problem. So, so uh, let's leave Romans um, 14 for just a moment and go over to Jesus. Uh, it's actually Luke 12, but we go over to Jesus, and he's in the crowds. The crowds of people are surrounding him. Picture it there, kind of on the dirt roads of Israel, outskirts of Jerusalem. The crowds are with him. Uh, he's, uh, the, the lame have begun to walk. The blind can now see. The deaf are hearing. And he's a great teacher. So the people are crowding around Jesus as, as close as they can get to him. And then out of the crowd, one young man comes up and with his hands waving, trying to get the teacher's attention, trying to get the master, teacher, teacher. And Jesus looks at him and the man says, tell my brothers to divide the inheritance with me. So obviously somebody died in the family. Money was left. Things were left. And this young man didn't think he was getting his fair share. In other words, he wanted more. And that's not unusual for the day in which we live, people wanting more. So Jesus turns to him with his penetrating eyes. He looks straight at him, and this, this young man knew that he had the master's attention. And Jesus' eyes looked straight through him and said, Who made me a judge? And then he goes on, <laughs> and Jesus says to him, This is life. This is life giving words. These are life giving words. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What's he saying? Young man, get your eyes off of things. Get your eyes off of possessions and look to those things that are important, the eternal things, things beyond this life. That's what he was saying to the young man, you see? Wow. I think we can draw from that a couple of things. Number one, don't judge. Number one, don't always be given your opinion. Don't judge, but speak life. Speak things that are full of life. Now, if we get, if we get those four words into our spirits today, we can leave right now and, and have the word of the Lord. Don't judge, speak life. Don't judge, speak. Don't give your opinion, speak life. Now, how are we going to speak life? Only if they have the word in our innermost being, and it just saturates us, and we are ready to give it because we know it, you see. 
Every situation where we might like to judge is an opportunity to present words of life. And there will be many opportunities where we would like to give our opinions. And see, the thing, every time we give our opinion, we say we know more about this than you do. That's kind of raising, raising us up. Another place Jesus said, do not judge or you will be judged. Okay, let's go back to Romans 14. Let's leave Jesus. Verse 1, accept the one whose faith is weak. See, the problem in the Roman church was there were a lot of born-again Christians who had come out of Judaism. So what were they doing? They are bringing the Jewish dietary laws with them. Oh, you can't eat this, you can't eat that, you can't do it this, you have to do it this way. And there were others who'd come into the freedom of Jesus and said, no, I'm free. I don't have to worry about all that. And so we, we're having conflict in the church. And, 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 and the writer, to Paul writes, he says, accept the one whose faith is weak. Accept them. See, <laughs> spiritual maturity is not required for Christian fellowship. You can be born again yesterday. And you come into the church, and we have people been, been here born again, walking with the Lord 30, 40 years. But we can have fellowship because we have Jesus. You see, that's the defining factor. And remember, God's love for me is not dependent on my maturity. I can be very immature in this walk with God. But Jesus still loves me. And Paul's not saying erase the differences. He is saying rise above them. Rise above the differences. And this is the challenge. God's supernatural love flowing through me, reaching out to you, removes the differences. Several months, well, I guess it was six weeks ago, our dear friend Madeline Simpson passed away, 96 years old, I think she was, 97 maybe. And uh, she was a faithful member here at church. And maybe 24, 25 years ago, I had visited her in her home in Ocean City in a pastoral visit, and we were chatting away. And, and she said, Roger, uh, I want to talk about my funeral. And she said, the one thing I want is the theme of love to be emphasized at my funeral. And so when she died six weeks ago, uh, Steve and, and I and uh, her nephew had the service, and we all tried to emphasize love to honor Madeline as she wished. She loved the Gaither Trio, Southern Gospel Music, as I do if you know anything about me. And Don Mote, who's the blind pianist for the Gaither uh, vocal band, tremendously talented man, he wrote this song two years ago, actually. And let me just read the lyrics of it. Uh, I think it says what, we, what needs to be said. The, the parking lot was full that Easter morning, suits and ties and bonnets, Sunday's finest filled the, pil filled the pews. <laughs> Pastor Rick was known for his long sermons. But we knew that he would give us something we could hold on to. <laughs> he walked up to the pulpit that morning, and we sat up in our seats. He slowly looked around and made us wait to hear him speak. Then he said... Love, love, love. And then he sat back down. It wasn't much. But man, it was enough. Because the one thing we all could use more of is love, love, love. The ladies on the front row, they didn't like it. And one of them said, whatever we pay him is too much. Mr. Johnson he said, we got dressed up for nothing, but at least we'll beat the Baptist to the Sunday brunch. But as for me, I got more from those three little words than from all the other sermons I've ever heard. 
when he said, love, 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 and sat back down. With that, I sit back down. Well, it's honored to follow this a little bit taller than me guy. I won't give my opinion about what I think about Southern Gospel. Because <laughs> we're not about opinions, are we? We're about truth. And we can keep our opinions to ourselves. Because it's one thing to catch a fish, it's another thing to keep the fish. You know, there's actually fish that are very jumpy. And when you catch them, you're wheeling them in, they're jumping. And some of those fish, you might get them into the boat, and they might be, you know, and jump right back out of the boat. So sometimes it seems like we got more people jumping out of the boat than we got staying in the boat. We got people getting messed up in church just as much as they were getting messed up in the world. And so that's what this uh, Romans 14 is all about, is making sure we get ourselves right so that when people come in here, they want to stay here. They want to remain exactly what Pastor Roger was saying. It's all about love, love, love not about our opinions and our judgment. And so, Pastor Roger covered the first few verses here in Romans 14. Then that big question in verse 3, third, 3 and 4 was, who are we to condemn? Who are we? Who do we think we are? You ever thought that about somebody? Who do you think you are? But how, much, how about us when we judge? Who do we think we are? One thing we got to always remember that we are God's workmanship. That means he saved us and he's the one that changes us. He's the one that keeps us. So who are we? If we are now pointing out, it's like me going up to Pastor Roger and saying, hey, man, you're just way too tall. You know, look at your body. When we point each other out and start calling, talking about each other, we're looking at each other's body the members of the body, and we're, and it's Christ's body. So we're making fun of Christ. We're looking down upon Christ when we're looking down upon each other. How would you feel if you were Christ? How do we feel if somebody looks down upon our, one of our children? And so who are we to condemn? It's God's work. It's God's workmanship. Some of us might think, well, man, look at them. They haven't changed much yet. Who are we to judge? They're God's work. We might be thinking that, you know, things should be different. We have all of our opinions about church, 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 but it's God's church, not ours. So we need to shut up. Hello? We need to learn to shut our mouth and keep our opinions to ourselves and give them to God and let them get out of our mind so we can focus on what really matters. Love, love, love. Amen? We've got to learn how to honor and respect one another as unto the Lord. God chose us. God chose each and every person in here. So when I'm dishonoring you is when I'm like looking down upon you. But it was God who chose you. So I'm really looking down upon God. God, you should never chose them. It's like being on a basketball team or that you, you know, you had some guys together and some ladies and you chose different players and and. And now you're on this team and you don't like the player that's on the team. But you didn't choose them. Someone else did. So who are you? (laughs) God chose us. And so we need to stop condemning each other. Stop looking down upon each other. They're God's work. The best thing we can do when we see something that we don't like is pray. Pray for the person. Let God get involved. Because who is the... You know what Satan's ministry is? Satan has a ministry. Accusation or condemnation, the same thing. That's his ministry. Do we want to line up with Satan and be involved in his work? We want to be involved in God's work. What's God's ministry? Reconciliation. So it's about reconciling each other to God, reconciling each other with one another. So we got to honor each other. we got to live to honor the Lord. To live to honor the Lord is to honor all those that... God has placed in our life to love and respect them no matter what we think about their opinions. 
we got to let that stuff go. These were just matters like eating and what day to worship. And yet it was a big deal, especially to Jewish believers, because this is what they had been practicing for generations upon generations. And this is all they knew, what, knew was there's a certain way you eat, there's things you don't eat, there's things you do eat, and there's a certain day that you come together and worship. And so now that they were born again, and now you have these Gentile believers who knew nothing about that kind of stuff, that was that conflict. And we ourselves have all kinds of conflicts. Some of us grew up in different churches, different ways of doing worship, different ways of uh, different things. Some of us, let's take an example like alcohol. Some of us have this deep conviction that you are never to drink alcohol ever. Others think it's okay to drink sometimes. There's other issues that we make a big deal about, but biblically, they're minors. They're not majors. And we need to major in the majors and minor in the minors. There's some things that just really don't matter. It really is just our preference. And what we need to matter, what matters is truth, not our preferences, not our opinions. Because the goal is to get along. Because when we can get along with each other, guess what happens? There's an atmosphere of love. When people come in here, they're going to want to remain here. They're going to want to connect with this body because they feel this love. The world longs to feel love. They long to step into a place where there is actually peace. Actually, there's joy. There's actually people that love even and care for each other. So if we can provide that, we might not have all the smoke and, and, you know, in our worship, you know, we have all this kind of stuff and, and we have all these amazing programs and all that. None of that really matters. What really matters is love. If we have love, people are going to want to be here amongst us and stay here amongst us. Amen? So do not look down on others. Romans 14 says, 10 says, So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We will stand judged by God. So we need to stop judging others because we will be judged by God by how we judged others. So we better honor each other. The work of the Lord. Let's just focus on that. For the scriptures say, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess allegiance to God. So condemnation, judgment is the same as gossip. It's the same as backbiting. Con condemnation actually means disapproval in public means you're disproving of somebody in public. That's condemnation. You're condemning them. And that is a no-no in God's eyes. God hates it because does anybody, anybody here love to be judged or condemned or gossiped about? Do you feel good? Do you want to stay in a room that you feel that kind of stuff happening? No, we want to run from that. Some of us have family members who do that. How, how many of you enjoy... Thanksgiving or Christmas, if you have that kind of family, when you get there, you know they're judging you, they're condemning you, they're speaking evil of you, they're looking at ways to criticize you. Some of us have family members like that, so we're not like really excited about the holiday season coming up, because when we get together with them, it's not fun. It's not a good atmosphere. So we don't want to trip anyone up. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Do you know anybody that's no longer going to church because of something that happened in church? Anybody? I know plenty. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are just watching online only because they'd rather not be here or another church. There's some people that have left fellowship because they don't want to deal with the people. They love God still, but they don't want to deal with the people. So they'd rather just stay away and just worship God from afar. But we know that's not God's will. God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So we know God's will is for us to assemble. We know that when we assemble, God is pouring out His Spirit. And as He's pouring out His Spirit, He's equipping us, He's encouraging us, He's building us up in this kind of atmosphere. So it's Satan's job to divide us. Satan's job to keep us away from each other, keep us from fellowship. And so when we 
talk about each other, when we have bad attitudes towards each other, when we criticize and fault find, we're, it's like we're putting our foot out for somebody to fall. We should expect that in the world from unbelievers to try to trip us up, try to draw us into darkness. But from the, in the church amongst other Christians, we shouldn't be, that should not be the place where we're getting tripped. This is the place where we should be being lifted up and encouraged and feeling stronger and feeling better. That we would rather not leave. We want to stay. Even though the Eagles might be playing at 1 o'clock today, we want to stay. <laughs> because it's such an environment of peace and joy and love. I know when I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you're not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died for. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. So some of us, we have our preferences. We have our different convictions that are not majors in the Bible. I know Pastor Roger, if I wanted to dishonor him, I would drink a glass of wine in front of him because he would be very much opposed to that because I know him and I know that he's very much against drinking of any kind. Talking about a Sabbath day, my good friend Garth, Pastor Garth from Egg Harbor City, he worships on Saturday because he feels the conviction, him and his church, that Saturday is the day to worship. Now for me, every day is the day of worship. There's no one day better than another day. That was what's set up for a period and a time, but now we're in this. But I'm not going to disfellowship with my friend Garth because he worships on Saturday. We worship on Sunday. And really, I really believe every day and any day can be a day of worship. But I'm not going to disfellowship because I'm going to honor his, his conviction. We all have different convictions for some, different reasons. Some of us might have the conviction of alcohol because we're prone that if we drink anything, we could easily become an alcoholic. It's in our blood, it's in our, in our gener genes, it's in our generations. So therefore, we have this conviction. So we have different convictions for different reasons. Some of us grew up in a Pentecostal service or church as a child, so we have a different conviction. You might feel like a woman has to wear a dress all the time. Or you should never go out to the movies like my wife believed and her Wesleyan holiness upbringing. That was her conviction at that time. So I had to honor her and not go to the movies. When I first met Lorraine, she, her big thing was a guy does not wear an earring. I had an earring. Do you see me with an earring? Have you ever seen me with an earring? Because she didn't like it, I took it out. Because I wanted to honor her. She felt that it was a worldly thing to, for a guy to wear an earring. So I'm going to honor your conviction because I want to marry you. <laughs> so I'm not going to let that be a stumbling block. So we've got to stop letting petty little things cause us to stumble. We've got to get past all that stuff. We're a church made up of many different people from many different backgrounds. What shows the glory of God is when we can actually get, to get, get together and stay together and worship the Lord together and do the work of the Lord together because we all have one thing in common, Jesus Christ. As long as that is in common, we can, we can keep moving together. And for the world, that displays that God is real because only God could do that. Now, this is the key scripture I really wanted us to mainly focus on this morning. And it's verse 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it's not about so much what we're doing. It's more about our being. It's about our being. It's about our character. It's about our lifestyle. Living a lifestyle of joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Being in the Spirit. When you're in the Spirit, things just don't matter anymore. Things that we make a big deal about. We stop judging. It's just not possible in the Spirit. We don't act like that no more. You know, we can be a room where I'm preaching, but everybody out there is not just receiving from the Lord. They're just judging me. Because that's our culture. In the flesh, that's how we're going to be. If you're sitting and watching somebody, you're... You're judging them. You're looking at every little thing, you're looking at every little flaw, waiting for me to mess up with my grammar, or waiting for me to, uh, you know, 
my uh, shirts unbuttoned in one area, or I have something in my hair, or whatever. We're just looking at that. We're in, in the morning when we see something we don't like, we stop even listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we need to get in the Spirit. We need to be people of the Spirit. We need to be people of the kingdom, kingdom people. Serving the king in his, in, 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 his, in his kingdom. And when we're about that, we don't have time to get caught up in all this nonsense that we get caught up in so often. That Pastor Steve and I spend the majority of our week in worship and prayer and, and the word and preparing to minister rather than taking out fires. Having all kinds of meetings of reconciliation because we can't get along with each other and we got issues with each other. Let us get past that. Yeah, we got to address those things when needed, but let it be less and less and less because we're just above that. We're spiritual people, not carnal. We're kingdom minded. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God. So how do we not please God? When we get caught up in all the petty little issues, when we are gossiping and backbiting and, and causing conflict and causing people to stumble, that's when God is not pleased with us. So we do, do we want to please our daddy? Then we get along with each other. So then let us aim for harmony. Let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. That's what it's all about. Harmony in the church. When there's unity in the church, there's power that's demonstrated. God's power is demonstrated in the, where there's the spirit of unity. So if we want to see more of God's power, we want to see more people healed, more people delivered, more people growing and being transformed in the presence of God and going out and changing our world, then we need to have the spirit of unity. And each of us have a part to play in that. Just because I'm up here behind the pulpit preaching doesn't mean you don't have a part to play in our gathering. Your heart, your attitude, all of our hearts, all of our attitudes de determine what kind of atmosphere we have here. What kind of spirit is moving. And if it's the spirit of God, then there will be power. And all of a sudden, people will start getting set free. And the word will spread. And the people who are in need, just like they did with Jesus, they would come for miles and looking to him. And the crowds would form. And then miracles would take place. And then the kingdom of God would advance. So what are we bringing when we come? What are we offering? Are we in unity? Are we in harmony? Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. So we have freedom, but our freedom shouldn't take away someone else's freedom. Our freedom, we have to respect everyone's freedom at the same time. So there's certain things that we must do not around other people because it violates their conviction, their freedom. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another to stumble. And the last couple of verses, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. If we could just keep things to ourselves, we'd be in a lot less trouble. Hello? Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something that they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you're sinning if you go ahead and do it. As we all know, Pastor Steve is a, a, basically a vegan. He eats salmon, though, so that's what you call a pescatarian. pescatarian. He's technically a pescatarian, but you, see, you hear him coming up here and telling you all, you must do that. You must all become like him or you're sinning because that's something that's your own personal conviction. What you eat or don't eat is your own choice. You have the freedom to choose what you eat or not to eat. It's not a law. So you don't hear Pastor Steve condemning any, anyone. Oh, I saw, I saw you eat a big piece of beef. You're going to hell. <laughs> you don't hear that because that would be wrong. But you still honor Pastor Steve. If he came over for your house and had dinner, you wouldn't serve him a big piece of steak because that would dishonor him. So we just have to think of that. As we know each other, we find each other's preferences, our, you know, our differences, the way we think, the way we're wired. We try to respect that and we try to honor that. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you're not following your convictions. 
If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So we want to get free of sin. We don't want to cause others to stumble and cause others to sin, and we ourselves don't want to be in sin. So the best thing we can do is what? Repent. If we've caused anyone to stumble in our life, what should we do? Repent. If we're aware of it, let Holy Spirit breathe on us right now and speak to us. If there's anything that you've done and caused anyone else to stumble, there might be people not attending church anymore because of something you did, some attitude that you had. Let's get right with them. Let's repent. And let God do what he does best, reconcile. So we have a closing song that Pastor Roger chose. It might be Southern Gospel. Oh, it is? I had a song, but we're going to Southern Gospel instead. But hallelujah, it's his song. He loves it, so I'm going to try to love it myself. But if you can, if you're able to, stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord, and let's let the Lord do a work in our hearts. I don't, uh, I don't care if you stand or sit, that's your choice. The Southern Gospel people, they don't care what you do. Now, uh, this is a song that uh, was written uh, in the late 1950s, I was 59 actually, by, can you hear me? By a uh, Methodist preacher down in Florida. And uh, he struggled a lot with health. And, uh, you know, we discover in this God walk <laughs> that often the struggle will bring out one. The one that struggle often God-like disclosed to man. And that was the case with this, uh, with this man down in Florida. And he wrote uh, a song called Fill My Cup. He said, like the woman at the well. I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. Have we now all been there? Seeking for things that did not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well. Jesus has an artesian well, always flowing, that never shall run dry. So what is our prayer? And as Steve and Donovan uh, sing the chorus, especially Somehow enter in however you feel, hum or sing. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the thirsting of my soul. All right, let's see what happens here.
Father, this morning for filling our cup. Thank you, Lord, not just filling it, but where it overflows and began to touch the lives of those around us. So we leave this place wherever we may go into our homes and our, with our families, amongst friends, football gatherings, out to lunch, wherever we are, Lord God, let the overflow. And Lord, let us be people who reconcile, not condemn. Let us be people who lift up, not cause people to stumble. And so, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you, and we thank you, Lord, for your mighty work. In Jesus' name, if anybody needs prayer, salvation, healing, whatever it may be, please come forward. There'll be people here to pray with you. God bless you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, head over to the website at praisetabernacle.church where you can learn about all the ministries Praise has to offer. Find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. We hope to see you soon right here at Praise Tabernacle because we are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.